So I'm here with Kelly, and uh, what's your horse's name? Dakota. Dakota. Mm -hmm. Here with Dakota. And you've been having a little bit of trouble with him, from yes. what I understand. Yep. Could you kind of tell us, Paul, you've had him a little bit of the history and kind of what are the main uh, challenges you've sure. been having with him? Um, I purchased him two years ago. It'll be two years ago in August from Katie's Corral. No history on him. Um, bought him grade. He was estimated by the vet to be approximately six years old at the time. Um, he was very thin when I got him. And... Um, started out okay. We went trail riding right away, like to Dodgeville, no problems, but obviously I think it was because he was underweight, didn't have the energy to mm. do anything. Yeah, you were just showing me a picture, and he was he was pretty underweight when you first got him. He's, it looks You wouldn't even almost recognize him looking at him exactly. now. Um, but but he's he was how old when you got him? Um, approximately six. He was so. six, so he's eight now. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so he might have bulked up a little bit in that time anyways. Yes. but yeah. Okay. Um, and so... So um, how did the trail riding go when you... It went took well. Riding. I we cantered a little bit. We just did whatever, mostly walk and trot, but it went well. Um, we took the longest course that day. So, I, so when did the trouble start to happen, or what was the trouble that you were having? Um, the first time there was trouble was back at where I was boarding. I took him out into the field, and we were just I went to lope on him, and he did a jump sideways, and okay. instantly it threw me on the ground. So, I was thinking probably a balance issue with me. Um, then things were going fine again, and then pretty soon we'd be out on another ride in a field, and he would do the same thing. And it, I kind of wondered if it was something that he had learned, that mm. that's what he could do to get me off. Um, I had somebody suggest that possibly the saddle I had wasn't fitting correctly, and found out that the saddle I bought was semi-quarter horse bars instead of full. Okay. So I had a saddle fitter come out and um, fit him, and I bought a saddle. Um, they made a saddle for us and things started going really well he no longer was doing that side move we were doing great um and then probably i'm trying to think a year ago this last january i was in an indoor lesson and went to canter on him and this was with his old saddle sorry and he went to go canter but did the side hop again the saddle was too loose i came off broke my tailbone different things so then I was off of him for like six months um, he has even since with the new camp saddle started doing the side hop thing too so have we decided it wasn't just the saddle is that what yeah <laughs> I thought, at first I thought because he really settled into it and it was like he almost took a deep breath and it was mm. like a good thing so I thought that was over but yeah it's been back too yeah it it's I and I don't know what the saddle is but yeah saddle saddle fit would definitely change things the, I personally don't think a lot of horses will just do a full-on bucking spree or really dramatic moves from just an ill-fitting saddle. Mm -hmm. I mean, pending, there isn't something like really sharp pointing at them sure. or something like that. But it just a lot of times people want to blame the saddle. And I think, yeah, I, I want my horses to be fully comfortable. I make sure my tech fits great. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I think if a saddle isn't fitting 100% correctly it doesn't necessarily justify going into a buck or a, mm -hmm. a big jump or something like that. Um, but I, there's a lot of people that see a horse do that and their first thought is always, it's always the saddle fit or it's always, oh, their back is so or something. And I think we just need to appreciate a little bit that it, bucking is or jumping sideways or kicking out is a way for a horse to object in some way to something, either because they're a little scared or they don't want to go forward or various reasons. But that's one of the ways they communicate to us. They don't appreciate what we're offering them and it's feedback, you know. And so, yeah, we got to look at the tack. Uh, but we also want to look at the whole picture of everything else that was going on. What did you do? What did he do? Yep. What was the situation? Was he um, feeling uncomfortable and a little bit stressed? Was he really relaxed? Mm -hmm. What was all going on? Um, so is there any other details that I should know before yeah. we get started? And since part of that, so I'm terrible at talking on the fly. So what you reminded me was that we had kind of, I had kind of come across that decision too, was that it was communication from him um, and that... What did I want to say here? Back. Dakota, back. Um, there was, um, I've been taking lessons um, every other week with somebody, and we switched to a different girth for him, a neoprene girth. And I hopped on him, and it was crooked, so I shifted my weight and asked him to walk on, and he immediately went into bronc mode. He was full bronc. And what it was, it pinched him. So mm. it was, he was communicating that there was something wrong. You yeah. Know, so. so I don't, no, I don't know him and you, mm -hmm. but 
that doesn't add up to me. Mm -hmm. A cinch, a, a different cinch pinching him a little bit doesn't equal a bronking, mm -hmm. bucking spree to me. Really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> like, Great. that's what I'm saying is that doesn't itch. I, I am really big on getting horses to understand what we want, helping them feel comfortable, doing what's best for them, having good fitting tack, taking good care of them, all those things. But at the same time, I want to have a little bit higher levels of tolerance where if you just switch your girth, if that's all it takes for him to, to decide he's going to buck, there's probably more to the story there is what I'm getting at than just that. And, and the other thing that we haven't gotten to is you didn't call a saddle fitter. You called me. <laughs> and so, yeah, so there's somewhere in here that you're not, you're, you haven't really disclosed yet is that right. you do feel like there is some level of behavioral issues yes. because that's what I do. <laughs> um, yes. and so, so if, if we were, if I was a saddle fitter here, you know, then we could carry on with that, exactly. that talk. But I feel like there's, I'm sniffing that there's a little more to the story here and than I'm just saddle fit. Because I'm terrible at <laughs> Um, but but tell me kind of why why would you call me and not a saddle fitter if you if you feel like it was mostly a tack issue? I'm gonna excuse me. I'm gonna keep getting closer here so we That's can fine. get your so, on the mic here. Definitely, I think that I'm kind of a lovey person with him. He needs to learn more respect for me. Okay. I kind of was thinking maybe you need to train me and not him. <laughs> but there are definitely holes in his training. For instance, he trips when he's. Um, trotting he trips when he's loping which I haven't done a lot of on him um, there's just communication yeah maybe we could also say leadership yeah that's you know <laughs> you know leadership of, of you like and I, I run into this quite a bit where people really want to be their horse's friend uh -huh. And I want to be their friend too, but I want to be their leader first. And, you know, you'd be amazed at how upset you can get with people on Facebook or YouTube by just saying horses need a leader. To me, I've had really good examples of leaders in my life just as a person. And l saying somebody is a leader to me is a good thing. I'm like, I'm, I want a good leader because then I know exactly what I'm responsible for, what I'm supposed to do. I have support when I need it. I feel more comfortable taking on the next thing because I have leadership there to support me, right? I want to be that for my horse. I want to be a comfort zone for them that they can trust in what I'm asking them to do, that they feel safer when they're with me, that they feel... Um, you know, more courageous in, in life and in situations because of a good leadership. So I don't see leadership as being the boss or being dominant over them or showing them who's boss or, you know, any of that kind of stuff. That's not what leadership evokes for me. Um, but just, just the way, like even there whinnying that saying his herd isn't here, even though I'm going, his herd is here, but he, we need to communicate that to him that his, his herd is here and he doesn't need to worry about that. Um, so yeah, so that's what I'm saying. And the last time I came up with him was, that he doesn't see me as his leader and someone he can trust on, you know, when he say, say that again. The last time, when was the last time you came off him? Um, about three weeks ago. Okay. Three weeks ago. And that's what yeah. prompted the email to it me is, and that sort of thing. It, I mean, I'd been thinking about it, but it just is very clear to me that he does not trust me as his leader and yeah. that he's fearful and he's acting out because he does, he's yeah. unsure. How, how many, how many times have you come off of him? Oh my God. <laughs> Do I have to say it out loud? Probably 10 Ten, ten times. Wow. Wow. So again, it's interesting to me. A lot of people want to claim saddle fit. Something pinched them that we would love to have like pretty easy, like it's pretty easy to swap out your cinch. Pretty easy to even swap out a saddle pending a couple thousand dollars, maybe difference there. Um, but sometimes there's more, you know, 10 times, like I'm just going, that's not a big enough reason for a horse to, to justify a horse blowing up and bucking us off. I, I want to have higher tolerances. Bigger thresholds where a little bit more could go wrong and they would still yeah. be a partner for me, you know, because, because life isn't perfect. Things happen. Things come up. Right. Cinches don't fit perfectly all the time. Like I just want to, now, of course I want to, I want the rest equipment for him. I want him to feel good. I'm mm -hmm. not saying that, mm -hmm. but I am saying that he need, he's got some role in this too, yeah. of he being, does. being there. He um, does. and that's, that's what I'm interested in is figuring out if. Who's, I'm figuring out, I'm trying to figure out who started it, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> you know, and, and that means, you know, like when you're a kid and you're in the back seat and the parents are like, who, you know, who started, <laughs> who started that little thing back there? Um, and I, I need to know who started it. Meaning, did you get on and you clamped on with your spurs and said, yeehaw, let's go down the trail hundred miles an hour. Some people do. And I'd go, well, your horse didn't appreciate what you were offering there. Or were, were you get on soft and easy and you had them cinched up? You had a, what you thought was a good tack. Good, you wouldn't have put that neoprene cinch on him if you thought it didn't, wasn't right. fin, finish pinching him or something. Um, and so I'm going, okay, did he not hold up his end of the deal? Mm -hmm. 
and and um, be a partner while you are mounting him and, and adjusting the saddle and that sort of thing. So so that's what we need to figure out. So I think what we're going to do next is we'll get out in the arena. I'm going to have you just move, move him around a little bit on the ground, and I just kind of want to see how you and him interact, okay. and we'll go from there. All right, sounds good. All right, thank you very much, thank Kelly. You. So it looks like you've been doing some groundwork with him. Yeah? Is there any problems with the groundwork stuff? No, he likes to try to be sassy. Does he buck with the saddle much when you first saddle him? He has. He has? He used to not, but that started where he... And um, was the... Sorry, go ahead. So he's he's started bucking more um, when yeah. on the ground when when being saddled stuff. If I make him, I do make him work through it, and eventually comes off yep. of it. Yep. I did just yesterday switch him back to his fleece skirt, got rid of the neoprene, thinking maybe that was yeah. again causing him to buck while doing groundwork. Did that change anything? Um, he wasn't as bad last night. Oh. It, he worked through it quicker. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Can I see a canter him a little bit? Yep. And was that the last time you rode him three weeks ago? And what, how'd it go? It was fine. My confidence is just shot, so. Okay. So you rode him for half a lap last night, but you were terrified the whole time? I wasn't terrified. Um, I was just very leery of was he going to do something. Yeah. Yeah, that's understandable. Um, and, you know, one of the hard things when you, when you have an accident with a horse is that we can read each other's kind of feeling like there's a, there's an energy or a vibe that's kind of being put off. It's like if somebody walks in the room and you can tell that they're, they're really happy or they're really upset. You can just tell they don't have to say anything. <laughs> you know, they don't have to slam the door to know something doesn't feel right about that person. They're a little off or they're a little whatever. So what I'm getting at is if you're a little nervous and you're on a horse, you can't fool them. You can't hide that from them. And we really need to be a confident rider for our horse to give them comfort. And so that's one of the reasons why, you know, like certain people that are good at starting colts are good at starting colts is they are projecting this confidence into that horse. Um, and so if a rider has lost their confidence with a horse, um, sometimes it's hard for them to offer that horse that leadership and that feel of the positive attitude. So that's something that we're going to have to keep an eye on and take a look at. But the groundwork seems pretty good, you know, um, the horse seems fairly willing to, to move for her and um, ask for things. Um, right now I'm, my thought is I'm leaning towards, um, he gets a little worried, a little nervous for various things. And that's why he spooks sideways or bucks. And it doesn't take much of a change of equipment to kind of trigger that, but that still comes from him being un, unconfident. And he's kind of learned because of how many times this has happened in the past two years. Uh, it lends itself towards a horse learning to get relief with the rider coming off and that's going to lead to them doing that behavior more. So what we need to do is we need to raise those thresholds and those tolerances by challenging the horse with a few things on the ground and release the horse to being ridden. So we're going to hopefully set it up to where riding this horse is the easiest thing he did this afternoon. Uh, but we're going to set it up in a way that's getting that horse to think and use his left side of his brain more and more and uh, get more comfortable. All right, Kelly, I think I've seen what I needed to see. Um, it's okay, I'll take it from here. And uh, you're good with me challenging him a little bit? Yep, absolutely. You're like, that's why I came. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna test him with a few things here without the saddle, then we'll go ahead and saddle him up. We'll go from there. All right. So two things that can startle or scare horses. One is rhythmic motion, rhythmic pressure, and one of the most scary things to horses is steady pressure, yeah. steady pressure. So if you take a, and I use this example a lot because where I really learned this idea is from wild Mustangs. If you have a, had a wild Mustang in this arena and you 
you got two of them, let's say. So you got one over here and you got one over there. And I got a stick and a flag down here with mine and you got a, a halter and lead rope on yours. They've never been handled before, but you know, say they're in a pen and we're gonna let them out. And both of us are, are, it's a competition. Who can get their Mustang to the other side of the arena quicker? And I can herd mine down there, but you have to lead yours down there with a halter and lead rope. Which one's gonna get there first? Yours. The one's leading. As soon as you put a feel on that halter and lead rope, that horse is gonna panic and feel like the world's coming to an end for that horse because it's, it's, a, it's an innate instinctual response to push into pressure if the predator's got a hold of them. That's steady, so that's steady pressure. That's our saddle, that's our legs, that's the bit when we pick up a feel or the you know, reins, whatever you're using on their, on their head. Um, the farrier working on them, the vet. So almost any wreck that you've ever seen happen with a horse, it's almost always caused from steady pressure or a failure to yield to steady pressure. Okay, think of a horse tied up to a rail and they, they felt pressure. Maybe that horse has stand tied there for days and days, years and years, and then all of a sudden today, some you know somebody walked by too quickly and it set them off and now they're, now they're pulling back. Um, it doesn't take much to get them to that place. And so we need to prepare our horses for that and expose them to steady pressure and that kind of thing. So that's what I'm wondering to myself about him. And because of the issues with the cinch and you kind of kind of isolating your focus on, it's about the saddle and the cinch, well, it's like that's steady pressure. So I don't go the saddle, I go steady pressure. That's what I'm thinking, we'll see. Uh, we'll see if my theory is, is true here or not with him. I know the theory of steady pressure is very scary to horses. Another example, and I use the Mustang example, so again, here, first thing, if I, if I put a little rhythmic pressure on him, I'm asking him to go forward, but his first response was to go sideways. Now, he's not getting relief for going sideways. He's going to get relief from the flag when he goes forward. Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. He's still trying to go sideways. There. Do you see the change there? So his sideways is his, been his move, right? So I'm not gonna release him when he goes sideways. I will release him when he goes forward. See, that time it met forward. And then I quit, I quit because he went forward, right? Now, the other thing that's interesting to me, Kelly, is I wouldn't get on a colt if they can't handle me just working this flag a little bit. Because especially trail riding, you don't know what's gonna happen out on the trail. So what I'm doing is I'm asking him to get in, in harmony with my intention. He's reading the flag instead of reading me. Think of the flag as the scary bushes on the side of the trail. The other horse spooking, the, the dog running out from underneath you, the, the, the turkey bomb taking off out of the wood. You know what I mean? Like stuff happens out there, right? And so this is gonna be that stuff happening. But I'm not gonna wait for that stuff to happen to me. I'm gonna go ahead and be prepared. I'd rather be prepared than lucky. You see what I'm saying here? And so I'm just gonna work this flag. Now he can choose to get bothered by it or he can relax and then it'll go away. It's his choice. When, when this goes from rhythmic motion, which is what it is now, to rhythmic pressure is when I change my intention. Right now I'm asking him to move. That's rhythmic pressure. Now it's rhythmic motion. I changed my intention. He needs to read that. If I was staring at you guys watching or, or Kelly, you could feel that, right? If I walk up to you like this, do you feel the pressure? There's a lot of pressure there, right? Versus if I just walk up over here like this, I'm like, do you feel any pressure? No, because I'm not looking at you, I'm just here. Even if I was like trying to kill flies on the ground or something with the flag. You know, it doesn't matter the flag moving, it matters where my eyes are, where my belly button is, where I'm, I'm putting that pressure, you know. Um, I don't know if this works for you guys at home watching, but if I went like this, that feels like more pressure. Like there's, there's pressure there. But there's something changing inside me every time when I do that. You know, it's like, and so I, I've, you learn as a horseman to turn it on and off. So it's like, oh, this thing is friendly. Let me just pet you. Let me use this to get those flies off you. We're just friendly here. And then when I want him to move, I switch to border collie mode. See him look at me now? And he's like, oh, I better, I better move away from that. Now I go to Labrador mode. 
you know, does that make sense? You just, you just change it. And he, you can see he, this, re, you can, it doesn't take too long to teach a horse this. This, this resonates with them. So now he's getting comfortable with it. I like to have it go from down low. Like horses can see things pretty well up here. They don't see things super well down here. And so it's kind of scary to have things go from low to high. So it's one of the tests that I do pretty frequently with them is I'll put it down low and I'll put it up high. When we do the Mustang taming, which I keep referring to, just learned a lot of skills from that. Um, I tell people, keep your whips up <laughs> all the time until they get more tame. Because if you start doing this with a Mustang, they're gonna go like that and strike at it. And you're gonna, you could teach a pattern of them striking at things. So we gotta be careful about when you're transitioning from side to side, keep it up high, because it's easier for them to see it. So when I'm trying to test a horse, like him that's not a Mustang, and you can see he's already settling into me messing with him. He's like, ah, oh, you're trying to scare me. I'm like, yeah, you caught me. You know, it's a game. And the, the game that he's learning is when he acts like a prey animal, I won't give him relief from whatever's scaring him. When he switches and he challenges it and he tries to understand it, he switches to a left brain side and goes, what's that? Then it goes away. And then I evoke that curiosity side. So we're, we end up strengthening that thinking side of their brain. I like to think of it like a muscle. The more you flex that muscle, the stronger it gets. Okay, so that's feeling pretty good. Um, you know, there's a few tests that I wanna do with him with a lariat rope here, but um, before we get to that, I'm gonna go ahead and saddle him up. Um, Hey Mary, can I ask you for a favor? Yeah. Somewhere over there by that round pen, there's a lariat rope with a blue Honda. It's a 45 foot long rope. Could you grab that for me? So we'll see if the saddle is to his liking or not. It should fit him pretty well. I, it's the saddle I use on my horses that are built pretty similar to him. It's a, one of my favorite kinds. It's a Jeff Smith. Shout out to Jeff Smith Saddles. They're not sponsoring this video, but maybe they should be. This has got a nice wide tree. But it's proven to work on a bunch. And then, you know, for horses that are a little bit goosey, I like to just use a, just a nice thick felt pad. Nothing, nothing fancy there to you know, have any weird, unique high points or low points or anything like that. You can just sit on the fence post right there, Mary, it would be great. I'll come grab it. Thank you very much. You're hired. So when I saddle up a horse, I like to do it two or three times where I tighten up, re-tighten up that cinch. So I just make it snug enough that hopefully if they jump around a little bit, I'll stay with them. I don't want it super loose where it'll roll underneath them. That'd be dangerous. Um, does your saddle have a back cinch? Yeah. Too? Okay. So that's not new. So this is just snugged up right now. And now I'll just kind of walk them off a little bit with it. And the last thing I want to do is like send them off at a canner and really try to, I don't want to startle him, you know, when we first, first saddle him. So I'll do it up kind of slow. And then I, usually they all kind of breathe in a little bit of air when you first saddle them. So I'll let them just kind of, kind of wind down from that. There we go. And we'll go ahead and tighten this up. Once I make sure that he's accepted the saddle, then we'll test him out on some of the things that I think will really get to the to the heart of the issue, which is steady pressure.
Now you guys notice in the video he's sweating a little bit. It's like 90 degrees right now. <laughs> it's it's a warm out here, and this it's kind of abnormally warm for Wisconsin. Um, but we got a warm one out here today. So you know, usually I kind of pride myself on the horses not getting too sweaty in the video because I I really don't use tiring them out at all to to help with training. I'm all about getting to their mind and building a connection. Um, but when it's this hot out, we're just going to be sweating even just standing around. Well, he seems to be packing that saddle around pretty good. I also like with a horse that likes to buck with a saddle, I like to send him over some obstacles. So we got a couple here in the arena that work pretty well. Very good. And we got to, of course, got to see him into a little bit of a canter. Oh. So, yeah, there's a little bit of him. And if, if that's all it takes to bother him, I know that saddle fits well. I know those cinches are good cinches. That one that's on him is almost brand new, and it's a really nice quality cinch. If he's getting that tight, he's getting tight from steady pressure caused by the cinches. So they're going to release him on forward. So that tells me we got to do more things with steady pressure to get him comfortable. That's, and that will also speak to his core nature. If he's, if you're riding him down the trail or around the rail of the arena and his baseline is just a little bit tight because he hasn't fully accepted your cinches. Well, then it's no wonder that things get worse in other situations where you ask him to canter. Like here, he didn't buck till I asked him to canter. Is that, you're seeing how it kind of makes sense now? So it wasn't really about cantering or trail riding or you. It was about him needing to be more okay with steady pressure. So again, he's doing the sideways thing. Pressure stays on. He finds relief moving forward. He needs to know that it's okay. So forward is the opposite of buck. Buck is, whoa, stopping, feeling like he can't go forward. So that's why I'm going to release him on forward. Forward is our friend in this case. The worst thing I could do is be shutting him down every time he goes forward faster than I wanted to. Which is another thing that beginner riders kind of will get themselves in predicaments with that a more confident rider might not on the same horse doing the same pattern, the same thing is if they're holding that horse back with the reins a little bit and you have a horse that already is feeling a little tight, that's gonna amplify that situation. You're nodding your head. Is that, does that resonate with you that could happen? Okay, so we've kind of got him accepting the saddle a little bit. Didn't take too much, but just, just by putting that saddle on him, got him a little bothered. So now I'm gonna go ahead and get my lariat rope out here in a second. And I'll just show you a few different ways. Kind of another lesser detail, but still an important one for this horse. His feet do a lot of different things. <laughs> There's a lot of commotion going on there. And if I was working with him on a regular basis, I would be more particular about getting his feet to have more motion. Meaning doing what I want more of the time. There, like that. That was a motion canner good emotion to it. The other ones were all commotion. It doesn't really matter. They counter canter, they do this, they do that. It's commotion. And so one of the things I teach people a lot is that there's a start, a middle, and an end to every sequence that we do with horses. And if you don't have, a lot of people, a lot of training programs emphasize the end. You know, don't release on a brace. Finish at the right moment. It's the release that teaches. We emphasize the end. What about the start? How did it start? Did we set it up in a way that the horse found the right answer right away the first try? And that's a really important thing, especially as you get into more maneuvers. Um, it's, just a, it's just a point that's not emphasized enough in my opinion. So we're gonna mess with him with this lariat rope here a little bit and we'll go from there. So I like to, you know, those of you that follow my channel, I, you know I like to put this layer rope on every which way possible. I do a thing called rope therapy, where I just get a horse to follow a feel from any part of their body with it. With him, we're gonna do a little bit of the, 
uh, the summary, <laughs> the summary version. We're just going to kind of go to, through a few points because um, we could spend the whole training session just getting them soft, which I would if we were doing this, you know, for the next month. But if we're just kind of seeing and doing an evaluation tonight, if this is kind of what's been bothering him, don't crowd me though. Let's put a feel there. See if he's okay with that. So he's handling that on his hindquarters really well. That's good. Good job. Now I'm going to put it on a hind leg. So when I do it here, I just like to see them wear it a little bit, make sure they're okay with it. Some horses get bothered there. And then I'll just pick up a feel on it. And I'll just kind of see what their response is. He had a pretty good response. I don't like how he's so quick to, to push, push through with his nose. That's a little bit of a hole. So that tells me he's actually maybe a little bit more comfortable in his right eye than his left eye. But see, me calling him out on these little things on the ground is what makes it possible to release him to being ridden. I'm just being picky about little things. And impressively, he's not getting too bothered about this here. I don't like that though. Do you see how you're so comfortable to just push through right there? There. That's also might be a little bit of a self-confidence issue. You know, he's, he's wanting to get confidence from me, but in this scenario, I'm asking him to be comfortable out there at a distance. I'm going to put it on one more spot here. <clears throat> we'll test, test it out. See if we can get him to pick his feet up a little bit. There we go. So I have it over my saddle, and then it's just gonna tickle him back here a little bit too. So we'll see if, how well he handles this here. So the, the idea is that it's a lot more ticklish back there by his flank. Oh, we're not getting any reaction there. So this is actually a pretty big surprise to me, how little reactions we're getting here. And I wonder how much of this is me calling his bluff a little bit a couple times there, like when he ran sideways and I didn't take the pressure off. Um, of him just kind of going, oh, okay, my, my usual stuff isn't going to work today. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and it actually might be a little bit less about him getting really bothered and more about him l having learned to do some of those moves. Does that make sense? But we're not really going to know until we go ahead and get on and see what we got under saddle. Sound like a plan? It does. All right. The way, the way he's acting today, is this seem like pretty good, pretty bad, pretty, no, pretty normal? normal. You know, he do so if I asked you to ride him tonight, you'd be like, you'd feel like, oh, I could ride him or? Yeah. That's what I was kind of thinking. And like I said, except for the one time with the day I put the new cinch on him, which probably wasn't it, that's the only time he's ever bought. Um, 
more spooking. <laughs> so I just want to make sure I got a little control. He feels pretty heavy in the bit, so I'm just doing some yields. These are what we would call suppling exercises, that if things went bad, I would want to be able to bend him and have this be a relaxing thing. So I'm just bending him and waiting for his feet to slow down and for him to feel soft. That's when I'll release, which is this, and I'm just doing, there's two of them. There's yielding the hindquarters and then there's a one rein stop. And these are the two things I would do with any horse if I was on a trail or any other time. And if they, it's like, if you're training a dog, it's nice to have a dog understand no. No means whatever you're doing, stop. Don't chew on that pillow. <laughs> Don't eat the cat. Don't, you know, climb on top of the counter. Okay, no, All right? So when I pick up the rein for this horse, if he spooks or if he trips like that, it's like, it's like no, don't do that. Does that make sense? It's just really simple. It's not you're in trouble. It's not a punishment. It's just no, like just stop. We're not going to do that. And so you're interrupting that mindset and you're just saying, no, we're not going to do that. The other thing you said when you got on him the other night, you rode around the rail. I'm not a big fan of going to the rail because that's actually a place that horses can get spooky at much easier than in the middle. I would rather ride him in the middle. He's, for, for what you've kind of said is your purposes of just enjoying a nice quiet trail horse, to me he's a little bit more sensitive to my leg than I would want for just that job. He's plenty sensitive if I wanted to work cattle and do spins and stops and high level performance maneuvers. Um, but for just trail riding, to me, he's a little bit reactive is what I'm getting at to legs and stuff. So I would wanna, what I would do is I would bend him around. Now right now I'm gonna put my legs on him. And to get my, to take my legs off is get quiet. Now the legs come off, just like the flag. The flag's not gonna go away because you reacted to it. <laughs> The flag will go away when you get soft and, and either stand still or just move forward. And so um, I would want him to, to get a little bit more dull to the legs just a little bit. Because again, if he spooks and you clamp down a little bit, which is going to be most riders natural instinct, I would want him to be a little less reactive. Right now, if you got a hold of him, it would be go. And if you said go and whoa at the same time, it's going to go to that way. That's what that leads to. So I would want him to get a little bit more desensitized to the rider's legs. <coughs> also, you hear him calling out and doing this. That's a horse that's going to be more spooky because he's not paying attention to the rider. Which is why every time he does that, I'm going to take a hold of him and do something. And basically I'm saying, no, pay attention to me. No, don't pay attention to the other horse. Yes, pay attention to the rider. Because if he's paying attention to me, paying attention to my seat, my legs, my reins, he's not gonna be a spooky. But if he's thinking outside the fence the whole time, well, of course he's gonna be spooking at things, right? How would we grade that stop? One out of 10. A seven is pretty good. I would I would give that about a three. And my point is, again, if you want a quiet, safe trail horse, I want good brakes. If you want a safe vehicle to drive down the road, you want a good brake system. You want to be able to stop when you want to stop, right? So that's another thing that I would work on with him is getting that stop a little stronger, a little more emphasis on the stopping part. I love the feeling of a horse that when, you, when I sit and set my hands it's just they can't stop quick enough you know it's a great feeling to have
The other thing, I know you don't canter a whole lot, and if I was working with you regularly, working with him, I probably wouldn't canter him a lot because I don't want him thinking about going to that gate very often unless you're really ready for it. I would get the trot really good and the brakes really good. I know it's fun to canter, but unless you're gonna be cantering him all the time, if you only canter once in a while, it can rev him up a little bit more. And, and it kind of says, yes, we go to this gear sometimes. And it's like, if you don't go to that gear very often, <coughs> then there's no reason if you squeeze with your legs a little bit after you spooked on the trail ride that he should think canter. You see what I'm saying? Um, again, if, if you know, if, if you were cantering all the time, then it'd be a different story. And it would actually be a helpful thing there. If we can't get a right lead here. There it is. So he's got a nice lope. But just for you riding him, I just wouldn't want him thinking to go there quite so quite so fast. No different than if I was, say I was training him for you, I don't need to teach him to roll back and lope off and do, do quick moves because where those quick moves live is ne right next to the same box that spooks live. <laughs> it's that higher, higher energy. And now again, if we're doing it all the time, it's a different deal. Like cantering him all the time would be really good for him to just kind of decompress a little bit. Um, but my advice to you would be if, if, if you weren't going to canter him a lot, I wouldn't canter him maybe at all. I would just Maybe on, on the ground a lot, but in the saddle, just walk and trot. Okay. That way, if you if you did get a hold of him, he would go. Well, we don't canter. Like she doesn't she doesn't want me to go faster. <laughs> but if it's like, oh, if every other ride we do want to go faster on the trail, like that's going to be the answer. Then I don't know. It's just a night. It's an idea. But I definitely would spend some time getting him a little bit desensitized to my legs, um, which he's which he's kind of doing just as we work here. I'll squeeze him here. Maybe I'll squeeze him until he backs up. And then I'll release. Just just take a little bit off. Don't don't do it. I'm not trying to teach him to spur stop or just some weird thing. I'm just doing it enough so that if you like, it just takes. See, like right now, I'm I'm squeezing right there. I just want him to question. I, I want you to be sure you want to go. That's how I want to feel on a on trail. Like I want them him to go. Yeah, she really wants me to go forward right now. Not um, let's go. You know, let's go and then and then. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> what do I need to do? So, are you going to recommend sending him to a trainer? I guess I want to be confident. It's a good question. I haven't I haven't seen you ride yet, and so I don't know how comfortable you are. If you if we and I were going to continue working together, I would put you on a horse that I know what they're going to do, mm -hmm. and I would see what your riding skills are. And then from there, if I'm like, oh yeah, she's got this, I'd be put, I'd put you back on him, but with a stronger warm up, a warm up strong to ride soft plan. Um, I will say my riding skills are not strong. If if yeah, if if I was like, nope, you need to learn a few things to be a better rider and leader for this horse. Well, then we would do that on a different horse because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't make sense to keep putting you back with this horse if if there's a there's a something that you're learning, a new technique, a new feel. Um, that would be my recommendation. And then from there, we would decide if, if somebody else could be riding him. He Overall, he feels pretty good. Um, like, the pieces are there. It, it didn't take too much. You know, we just you just pulled up here in the trailer and unloaded him. Here we are, you know. Like, that's a pretty minimal setup, you know, and he, he, he handled it pretty well. Um, I don't feel that he's really strong about wanting to get you off. I feel like because I warmed him up strong, it made it easy. And then because I picked little things to give him a hard time about, to communicate to him I'm the leader, he didn't test me with big things. But if I had let those little things go, they, they build up to a big, a big thing where he's doing his own deal. You know, even on the ground, so for instance, where he didn't want to move forward and he was going sideways instead, which is great, he can go sideways, but he does it with you and with somebody 
else that was working him on the ground much bigger than he would with me. With me, he's lazy about it. Probably because our energy was higher. Okay. I meant it a little bit more, okay. which is more of a natural leadership for him. You're coming into it as, let's just play together, let's just have fun, which is great if he's acting like a partner. But it's not great if he's not, if he needs leadership because he's getting worried, he needs somebody to, to take control of the situation, go, nope, you're okay because I'm okay and, and we're going to, we're going to work through this. And so I do think you need to, you need to think about a stronger warm up, like pushing his buttons a little bit more on the ground to release him to being ridden. I think that's really going to be the secret sauce because <laughs> he still is too, is a little too disconnected from my liking. I'd like him to be a little bit more committed to the rider. It's like, even though he's standing here in position, mentally, he's over there with the other horses. Again, that's a horse that was more likely to spook and do that. Okay. Th but the good news is we don't have to do anything real dramatic to get this. It's just chipping away at some little things here. Okay. Yep, there's just been a handful of things that were just kind of off um, that I think will make a big difference. Wonderful. All right, so we just finished up the session here with the Dakota. Um, just can you kind of give me a, an idea of what... Um, resonated with you, what you're going to take away from this this yes, little evaluation? I can. Some of the things that resonated with me and that I knew about, but I think I make excuses for him, is that I need to be a stronger leadership, um, have my focus directed more towards him so he knows that I mean business and maybe not just wanting to be his lovey-dovey friend all the time. Um, I saw him respond to you um, very easily, and that's what I'm hoping to get to. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, was there anything that surprised you about what I found with him or anything that was different that you weren't expecting? Um, I, obviously, yes. I liked how he calmed into you and um, was very good with you very quickly. Um, I know that he reads my anxiety and he feeds off of that. Um, the other thing that surprised me was how well he took the um, lariat on his legs and mm. stuff. He seemed really for not having that done by me in the last two years I've owned him very pretty calm about it yeah yeah I agree he was he surprised me with that and that's why it's an evaluation you know you gotta gotta try some things figured out and I told you as we were kind of getting him out of the trailer that if he handles it well it seems like no big deal but some horses they get really worked up and you just got to test a few situations and um, I think overall what we discovered was good news it's just some little adjustments that she needs to make in her leadership yep. and um, warm up strong to ride soft that's one of the big big takeaways and then uh, we need to build your confidence back with a horse that um, is a little more of a steady eddy a little more proven mm -hmm. and um, get, get you doing some of those and um Kind of build your confidence back yes. up, and, and then we'll put I the two of you back together. I was in too big of a hurry to be on him, but oh. I'll go back to what we were doing. Okay. I'm excited. Sounds good. Well, thank you very much, yes. Kelly, for thank coming you, out. Ryan. It was great working Appreciate with you it. and Dakota. Thank you. And uh, we'll keep you guys posted on where we go from here.